Welcome to Better Sex, where you get the information and inspiration to create and enjoy your best possible sex life. Join your host, sex therapist Jessa Zimmerman, as she brings you expert guests, helpful tips, knowledge, and strategies to improve your intimate relationships. And now, your host, Jessa Zimmerman. Hey, welcome back to the Better Sex Podcast. This is Jessa, welcoming you again. So glad you have tuned in to join me. I've got a really interesting conversation today. This is another one where we appear to be talking about one thing, and then we're sort of talking about more than that. Martha Cowpy is joining me on the show again. I talked to her about desire discrepancy way back when, and she's back to talk about her new book about polyamory, which first of all, she, well, she started writing it for clinicians, for therapists about how to help their clients with polyamory. And then it became clear that, wait, 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 she wants this actually to be for everybody. So people can just use this book as their own guide for navigating, potentially opening their relationship. And then she thought, wait, 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 this is actually for any couple dealing with any big issue where they might be on different pages about things or really need to be able to communicate. So it's sort of interesting how the question of should we open up, should we be polyamorous, really becomes like, how do we really navigate any differences or any heated topic or anything that could be loaded or could feel threatening or scary? How do we navigate that together as a couple? So it's really, it's a fascinating conversation. So it's, it's couched in this topic of polyamory and opening up your relationship. But what you're going to find is the entire conversation is relevant to you if you're in any committed relationship at all. So hopefully you will take a lot from the show and you'll go out and get her book so you can work through all of those worksheets and exercises. Anyway, enjoy. And before we start the show today, it is sponsored by Intimacy with Ease. It's a method to help otherwise happy couples achieve a sex life that is easy and fun for both of them. So you can actually just enjoy your sex life with zero stress. For more information, if you want to watch a brief little training video that's available, all of that, go to intimacywithease.com. Martha, thank you so much for being on the show with me. My pleasure. It's an honor. So tell me or tell us a little bit about how polyamory has come to be your focus at the moment, how, you know, why you wrote the book, because that's not all you see in your private practice, right? No, definitely not. I have kind of two areas of specialty. One is sexual health and function, and the other is LGBTQ and other marginalized sexual populations of which I would call polyamory one of them. Okay. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) And I ended up kind of niching down and specializing in polyamory specifically because I had a lot of clients who were telling me that they were having a hard time finding a therapist who was very much help about it. And so I divide my time about half and half between seeing clients and training therapists. It's kind of edging more towards training therapists now because I can help more clients that way. So I really, you know, when I teach a therapist how to work better with a tough issue, I'm helping way more clients than I have the time to see myself. So I ended up writing a book to train therapists. And then an interesting thing happened along the way. I realized some of the people who are unable to find therapists would be able to hand this book to their therapist. Some of them might not be able to find a therapist at all, or might not be able to afford a therapist. I wanted them to have a self-help manual. And so I started rewriting it for two audiences, not just therapists, but also people who want to open their relationship or people who have opened and are encountering difficulty. Yeah. It sounds like you're speaking direct, you know, specifically about polyamory in terms of a form of open relationship versus, you know, swinging or whatever else people might be considering doing, right? Like, could you speak to how you define polyamory for the purposes of this conversation? Yes. So I would define polyamory specifically as being a consensually open relationship structure where one, some, or all partners 
may choose to have additional romantic or sexual partners where romance is probably the defining factor as opposed to an open relationship style like friends with benefits where there's an agreement that there's not going to be a romantic connection. But I think that my book is equally relevant to any form of ethical non-monogamy, anything where it's a consensual situation. And honestly, I don't know if you've noticed in your practice, but not everybody who is in an open relationship is so consensually in an open relationship. Like <laughs> <laughs> sometimes infidelity kind of morphs into polyamory or sometimes somebody doesn't know that it's an option. And so they set things up kind of funky from the start or, you know, it, it isn't always perfect and beautiful and wrapped up with a bow. And it doesn't have to be for my book to be relevant. My book is about how to kind of get to something that is workable and comfortable and secure for everybody. Even if it started kind of messy. <laughs> it often <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> starts kind of messy. Yes. Okay. Yeah, even with the best intentions, I suppose, right? Exactly. Yeah, I definitely acknowledge the messy middle, you know, and, and when it comes to polyamory, it's often the messy beginning. Yeah. So why do people choose it? I mean, or maybe I, I don't know which question I want to start with. Is it an actual orientation? Like I have heard, you know, people sometimes talk about I am polyamorous, that's just my orientation, or I am monogamous versus a, a choice about how they're living. Mm -hmm. So like, to what degree do you think it's a really an identity and orientation? And then why else do people choose to be consensually non-monogamous? Uh, it's a great question. I think it's both, both and, and both and more. So like with most things, it can be a behavior. Like I did that because the opportunity presented itself and it made sense to me in the moment at the time with that particular situation, that would be an example of not an identity, but a behavior. Mm -hmm. And then for other people, it's an identity. Like I always saw myself this way. This is how I always imagined my relationship would look. I didn't even know there was a word for it. Or I know one person who says, I always pictured myself having a wife and a mistress. And I'm like, you know, there's a word for that. Like, and it's not infidelity. It doesn't have to be yeah. infidelity. So I think when people have a concept of what their life looks like that involves more than one intimate partner, that describes somebody who has an identity of polyamory. And that doesn't describe everybody. Some people right. are like, yeah, it just happened. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then it might just have happened and then developed into the way that they see themselves or not. Right. So if it's not somebody's identity, what are the kinds of reasons you hear people talk about for why this appeals to them, why they want this? Well, it solves a lot of problems for the people for whom it works. So one example would be, okay, I'm married for, you know, five years or 10 years or 15 years. And I, at some point I realize, oh gosh, I'm bi. I didn't realize it before. And I would like to explore it sometime in my life before I die. But I see no reason why I need to break up with my current partner to do it. But regardless of the gender of my current partner, most people just have one or two genders. And it might be that somebody who is bi wants to explore intimacy with another gender. So that would be one example. And I think that an open relationship structure can serve so well in a situation like that, because why would you need to break up yeah. a perfectly workable relationship that's doing just fine because you want to explore something else. And that could be like the example that I used of bisexuality or pansexuality, or it could be something like I want to explore kink. Right. And my current partner is just not interested in exploring kink, or I have discovered a fetish. I'm really into such and such, and it turns my partner off, but I don't want to just let go of this whole aspect of my eroticism. So that's one category of situation that might cause somebody to choose to open their relationship. Right, right. A big desire discrepancy might cause somebody to really think about whether they wanted to open their relationship. So if one partner really wants lots more sex than another partner does, and it is problematic for them, one way to resolve that situation, and again, polyamory and other forms of consensual non-monogamy work for some and not for all, but if it can work for this particular 
person that's thinking about it. This is a situation that's often helped by it because the person who wants more sex can go have more sex and it doesn't have to be a deal breaker. And it can, it's another situation where why would you need to break up with you know, the person that you're raising children with, that you've got a mortgage with, your life is working, everything is going well. And it's just this tension around not enough sex, too little sex, too much sex, whatever, you know, for somebody's preference. And so not only does it sort of solve the problem, it also bounces back into the relationship and strengthens the relationship because then that tension about that issue can just be not there. So, you know, then nobody has to feel pressured to have sex when they don't want to have sex. Nobody has to feel like they can't have sex when they want to have sex. Nobody has to worry about any of that stuff. And so some of the energy that went into that can go into the growth process around opening up. And ideally, that comes eventually to a situation where that energy was well invested because the original relationship can really thrive. But I'm imagining... This is more than just about problem solving. <laughs> you know, it's not like let's just solve problems. There must be ways people talk about their desire for this. It's way more aspirational. Like there, there's some benefit to it, not just about solving some problem I'm having with my current partner, but there's like real benefit in being in an intimate relationship with more than one person. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that I think is most important to talk about if you're thinking about opening your relationship. How might this benefit everybody? And people who come to me wanting to open their relationship, particularly if one partner is a little bit reluctant about it, often are looking at it in terms of what will I lose? And I think it's much more productive to talk about what might you gain because there are really significant gains to be gotten. Okay. Besides just problem solving. So what are, what are some of those? Yes. So, I I mean, the obvious, if somebody wants to have more than one sex partner, they can have more than one sex partner. If somebody wants to experience more than one kind of sex, more than one kind of partner, more diversity of whatever kind they're interested in, then they can bring that into their life. But it also expands the family in potentially in a way that's really nice. So, not all partners and partners of partners, metamors want to be friends or know each other, but when they do, it can be a really lovely kind of stable situation where everybody feels cared for and loved. And I'm thinking right now of a specific example of a couple that had an open relationship and had had for a long time. It was a V-shaped relationship where with a heterosexual cisgender couples. So the male partner was the one that had multiple partners. The female partner identified as monogamous, but they had a long-standing open relationship that was functioning really well. Then that monogamous female partner was diagnosed with cancer and she was ill and there was a long, long-term illness and a baby uh, in the house. And it was a lot to handle. And the metamor, the other partner who lived in a different state, frequently traveled to help the family Mm -hmm. and was part of the support system. And it's not that the wife and the metamor were close friends, but they were part of a family uh, together. And so she would come up and help with childcare and help with cooking and hang out and, you know, just be a family support every few weeks in whatever way was helpful. And it was a very beautiful example of Hmm. how having a little bit bigger of a family can really help out, you know, or somebody can run across town and shovel snow for somebody whose back is out. And, you know, you don't even have to like each other to support one another in these kinds of ways, because I think there's sort of a familial kind of appreciation for the ways that everybody benefits from everybody else being happy and supported. Yeah, it sounds like they're all invested in each other, really, to, no matter who's in relationship with who, that there's some sort of cross investment. Yes. And I really want to stress that they don't have to be like super, super excited about the situation to benefit <laughs> from it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think there are, there are a lot of ways, like networking kind of ways and support kind of ways and snow shoveling kind of ways. You can tell I live in Madison. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> We're not having snow the, snow, the, the snow shoveling thing in Seattle so much, but yeah. 
The other thing I hear people talk about some, I mean, I have some poly people in my uh, practice, of course, but it's not my specialty, but people talk, I, I think would say something about the self-development or evolution around the experience of compersion, right? Happiness at somebody else's pleasure, that there's some sort of growth that can happen to stepping into this, right? I mean, is that? That's absolutely true. And in fact, I think that in general, if I were going to make a general, overly generalized statement about people who are interested in polyamory, they tend also to be interested in personal growth and in relational growth. So these tend to be people who really are able and willing to tackle a self-help project. They want to get better at managing their emotions. They want to get better at transparency. They're inter- they've chosen a relationship structure that really demands pretty decent communication skills and some endurance with communicating, even if you're emotionally uncomfortable. And so it's a tremendous growth opportunity. But what I really want to say about it is that it's possible for any couple in any relationship shape, including monogamy, to develop these same kinds of skills. But there isn't quite the same like, eek. I need it now. Right, right. It doesn't quite get tested the same way. Like, yeah. (laughs) Exactly. But as I was writing my book, I realized a deep dive into what makes polyamory work is not that different from a deep dive into what makes any relationship work. So I think that for somebody who's really kind of a relationship geek or a personal growth geek, and who is open minded enough not to have trouble sort of wading through some words about polyamory. My book is a very, very deep dive into personal growth, including lots of strategies for managing lots of stuff and 25 or more worksheets. That's the same stuff I use with my clients, but it's also the same stuff I use in my own life. When I'm facing a tough situation, I'm preparing for a difficult conversation. I'm thinking through a tough topic. I'm trying to figure out why things are breaking down. It's the same stuff I use in my own life. Yeah. So I think that it's relevant to everybody. All right. So before we dive into those skills, because I definitely want to talk about that. What about somebody's poly or is interested in this and their partner is not? Like, first of all, can you be in a relationship where one person is monogamous? You just referred to somebody. So I'm answer- I'm imagining the answer is yes. But how does that work? And when does it become like coercion or something? Like where? what are the red flags around, you know, gosh, my partner wants this, but I really don't. So it's that question that took my book from being just another book about polyamory, except from a clinical viewpoint to a serious deep dive. And that's probably the, it's one of two main questions that I get. Like when I ask therapists, what are your toughest polyamory related issues that come up in therapy that I can help you with. That's question number one. Mm -hmm. Question number two is when I'm working with a couple that tried to open their relationship, things went badly wrong, but they still want to try it again. How do I help them do it better? So those are hard questions. (laughs) Like that's not, that's not polyamory 101. Okay. (laughs) And it's also not relationship therapy 101. So somehow I had to figure out how to write a book that was going to help people understand what is going on with these difficult relationship situations and to just broaden the scope. So if we're talking about one partner wants to open their relationship, the other does not. Yes, that can work. And in fact, that's one of my favorite kind of clients because they have a damn hard time finding a good therapist. Yeah, It's awfully tempting to say, no, this can't work. And most of what I've seen written about polyamory also says, no, this can't work, but it can. And there are lots and lots of couples where one identifies as polyamorous and the other identifies as monogamous. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And some of those evolved from situations that weren't so happy at the start, but that's not the only kind of really big dilemma that a couple might face. So another example of a not polyamory related, similarly thorny dilemma would be I want my elderly parents to move in with us in their later years and die here in our home with us taking care of them. And, oh, really? You don't? (laughs) Yeah. You know, that's another issue that is similarly thorny. It's fraught. It's emotional. There's a lot of tough emotions for both people in parsing out all this stuff. And it's not going to be one simple conversation. And there's not going to be one simple solution. Yeah. 
So I, all of the ways that I work with it, I wrote about. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Uh, It takes uh, figuring out what you think separate from what anybody else might want you to think, what you think, prefer, believe, and then get grounded enough to have the conversation about that where you talk about what you think and what you want, what you long for, what you desire, what you imagine for yourself, what you want for yourself, what's important to you. And then to be able to also be grounded and access curiosity when your partner is disagreeing with you or saying, I want my elderly parents to move in when everything in you is screaming, no, I'm terrified. I'm not ready. I think my whole life will fall apart or honey, I think I'd like to open my relationship. Shit. No, (laughs) it's going to ruin everything. Right. Yeah. So that's what I think is sort of the underlying relational skill set to work with any relational disagreement of any kind and of any magnitude. And I would call that skill set differentiation of self. Yeah. And I go into it in detail, each of these three skills and the holding steady, getting grounded part, and then how to kind of strengthen that and begin to move forward in a way that builds skill and helps you develop an ability to tolerate, an ability to see another perspective, even when you're feeling panicky, how to get more in control of your emotional reactions that you're not just triggered all the time on autopilot, you're able to access your neocortex and your thought processes and your empathy and connect while disagreeing. There's a lot that goes into it. And also including how to work with a dilemma. A part of me thinks this is a good idea. Another part of me is not so sure. So that's in there too. So it, it that's what I mean when I say like serious deep dive into tough relationship situations. Yeah. Hi, it's Jessa here, taking just a quick break. Thanks for listening so far. I wanted to let you know about the sex quiz that I've put together called How Healthy Is Your Sex Life? I've taken a close look at the typical ways that I see couples get into trouble with sex, including avoidance, neglect, negativity, distraction, and boredom. And the free quiz will score your individual results based on these factors. And then I provide my recommendations and ideas, including my top 10 sex tips, which will help you make instant improvement. If you'd like to take the quiz and see how healthy your sex life is, you can do it right now at sexhealthquiz.com. I do imagine that one of the ways this could work out for people is it is a deal breaker. We're not saying that anybody that's monogamous has to do this if your partner wants to, right? Like you still might come at the up through the end of this process realizing we want to mutually exclusive things. Yes, that is the same true for the elderly parents scenario. Right. (laughs) The thing is, I think a lot of people break up at the wrong time. So I think a lot of people break up when they're freaked out, their back is against the wall, and they think they have no option for how to move forward. And they're panicked or furiously angry or feeling a lot of resentment. And what I would much prefer is to help people figure out how to manage all of that and have some big, deep conversations and break up from a point of, oh, I love you. And we have some big differences that I think are ultimately not what I want in my life. So we're breaking up from a place of strength and empowerment rather than from a place of panic and disempowerment. All right. So let's talk about some of these skills then that are so crucial. What do couples need to develop to do this well? What are some of the pitfalls they might hit (laughs) if those are undeveloped? Well, you mentioned coercion and that's a pitfall. So I'm going to reference those differentiation skills again and go maybe a little slower through them. So the first one is to be able to look inside yourself and figure out what you think, what you feel, what you want, what you prefer, what you believe, what's your opinion, what's your belief, what are your values? And if you can't do that and then express that to someone else, even if they might disagree with you, it is going to be very hard to say no to something you don't want. So that's a big pitfall. And if there's coercion or a coercive vibe or resentment building, I would say somebody in the scenario has not adequately communicated what's true for them, or they haven't really given themselves permission 
to get in touch with what's true for them. And that can be for any number of reasons, including just like terror that you're going to lose your relationship. So that place of, oh my God, I will die if this relationship ends is not a good place to be coming from in terms of building strength in a relationship, regardless of whether it's monogamous or polyamorous. And that would be probably a nice course for individual therapy to get much stronger about what I want, what that's going to look like, and how I'm going to speak up and advocate for myself. And then I can stop worrying that I'm going to get pushed into something I don't want because I'm not pushable. Like I, I'm able to have a conversation about you, what you want, why it's important to you. And I'm able to say, this is what I want. And this is why it's important to me without having to dig in my feet, getting locked in cement. And then we've got a big gridlock and a push pull. And then we've got resentment building and there's a better way to do it. Yeah. So you can be open to influence, but not pushable, (laughs) right? Exactly. You can't can't be steamrolled. Yeah. Exactly. Good distinction. Yeah, that's right. So I think that that first part, some people really haven't yet given themselves permission to get in touch with what they want. So that might be, oh my God, I think I want something different in this relationship than what we have right now. I'd like to express something about this to you and hear what your thoughts are about it. I'm willing to grow and explore and I'm curious, you know, I'm curious to expand this conversation and expand my thinking. And I'm not scared to expand my thinking because I'm not steamrollable. So I want to consider all of the options and I want to read about what's possible. And I want to hear some stories from people for whom it's worked because I want to figure out whether it could work for me. And I can risk doing that because I'm not steamrollable. Yeah. Not if I give you an inch, you're going to take a mile, right? Like this is going to... Exactly. Like that, just that statement is showing a flaw in differentiation. If I give you an inch, you're going to take a mile. Nobody can take a mile. Right. 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 (laughs) I'd have to give that mile. Yes. (laughs) You'd have to give that mile. That's exactly right. And when I say development, like that's what I'm talking about. These are not behavioral skills. These are developmental tasks. Right. Right. Getting from somebody who can be steamrolled to becoming somebody who feels really solid in themselves and essentially secure in the world. Like I have the best advocate in the world for myself because that's me. Right, right. (laughs) I will advocate for myself and, and ultimately I'll see what can be expanded in the way I'm thinking about this, but the ultimate choice is going to be made by me and me alone and not from a place of fear or scarcity, but instead from a place of, I would like to choose a life that's even more incredible and abundant than this one. And so therefore that uh, apparently is not going to include you, you know, which kind of brings me to an interesting topic about polyamory, which is like, what is a breakup anyway? You know, if we're thinking about our cultural construct of serial monogamy, so if I'm married to you and then I develop a crush on this person at work, now I have to choose between these two. And if I really like this person at work and that relationship develops and it becomes infidelity, now I really have to choose in between the two of you. And then when the infidelity gets discovered, the shit hits the fan. Now I am being mandated to choose between the two of you. So what if instead you didn't have to choose between two people? What if instead you could say what you're interested in pursuing, pursue what you want to pursue figure out for yourself what you want each relationship to look like, like then all of a sudden we're like in a whole different universe where every relationship does not have to be perfect. Mm. Every relationship does not have to be the be all and end all of relationships. So you could have a relationship with somebody with whom you raise children and hold a household and you could have a friend with benefits who likes going to your local BDSM club once a month with you. And all of that could just be the way that it is. And you wouldn't like, why would you have made a choice between those two situations? And then of course that can get expanded however much you want to, but I think it's important to recognize that not everybody who's in a polyamorous relationship has gobs and gobs of partners, right? Lots of them, (laughs) lots of them have two partners. Yeah. (laughs) Some have three, some have four. And the study that I do, the average was just over two and the outlier on the upper end was 23. 
So that would indicate that a lot of people have just two. Yeah. 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 Right. right. For us to come up with an average of, you know, two point something. All right. So that makes me think of another potential differentiation skill, right? Emotional regulation. Like how is somebody yeah. managing jealousy, certainly, but whatever other emotions might get triggered. Exactly. Lots of emotions get triggered. I don't know if you've noticed in relationships in general, a lot of emotions get triggered. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's why I think like there's a lot that we can learn from any relationship renegade. Like I would call people who open their relationships. These are like courageous trailblazers who are doing something amazing and uh, going off script, you know, and that describes lots of people in lots of different kinds of situations. But I think we can learn a lot from them about emotional regulation. And there are other groups that we can learn a lot about emotional regulation too. But you're right. It's one of those critically important skills. I don't think anybody can be truly happy without a lot of skill in the emotional regulation department. So that's where I start, first of all, is from an assumption that you know, the Martha Happiness Project, the Jessa Happiness Project, <laughs> everybody's happiness project has a foundation of emotional self-regulation. Co-regulation is also nice. And that's when somebody else helps you to regulate your emotions. And the, you know, Disney model of relationship has taught us that co-regulation is everything. Right. Better um, not be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it better not be. That's exactly right. It's a shaky construct if that's all you got. Because what if your partner's not available for that right then? Or what if they're having the hardest day of their year at the same time that you're having the hardest day of your year? Who's going to like keep the ship afloat? When the chips are down, emotional self-regulation is money in the bank. And I think that it really ought to be part of everybody's happiness project and not something that you have to build so that you can manage a relationship emergency, but instead something that you want to build so that you can have a happy life and also incidentally, nice side effect, a super strong foundation for managing difficult situations that come up in relationships. Yeah. And difficult situations come up in every relationship. But if you're in an open relationship, one difficult emotion that's very likely to come up is jealousy. And if you already have some strategies for emotional self-regulation, so much the better. If you don't, that's fine. This is a way to build it, right? like having a difficult emotion and wanting to manage it is how you would develop that skill. And there are lots of strategies in my book for how to do that. And every therapist has a great big toolkit for helping people manage difficult emotions. I think the problem is culturally, we think of jealousy as different from other emotions. We think of jealousy as being a sign that somebody did me wrong. Like something is broken and wrong here and something bad happened to me that yeah. you did. <laughs> right. And therefore, this is not an emotional self-regulation uh, opportunity. This is a make it or break it opportunity. Yeah. And I would like to say, bullshit. I yeah. do not agree. This yeah. is simply an emotional regulation opportunity. You can take it or leave it, but it's not that different from managing anxiety, which I think we could all agree is an emotional regulation invitation, right? So I think they're closely related, actually. There are a lot of ways that people experience jealousy. There are a lot of ways that people experience anxiety. And the first and most important thing is to decide that you want to manage it. So if you have a therapist who's saying, you know what, I really think that all this would just poof, go away if you were in a monogamous relationship, that's not going to be helpful <laughs> right. for learning how to manage the tough emotion right? That's the make it or break it strategy, which is not going to be building any kind of skill that's going to be helpful, except, you know, that breakup skill, which, you know, let's face it, that can be a helpful skill once in a while, but ideally not right when you're like in the well of suffering from jealousy. So another thing that strikes me is honesty, being willing to enter into difficult conversations as opposed to avoidance would be an important skill in navigating <laughs> this too, right? Like, like I'm just going to wait until I get found out or something, but more like, Hey, can we, can I step into this conversation and process with you and be willing to engage? Yeah. And you know, it's so funny because this goes back to our earlier conversation about how not all polyamory starts out like all perfect and yeah. beautiful. I think more often than not, I see people stumble into it and then be like, okay, now I guess I do have to talk about some stuff. And I think we have 
a weakness culturally in terms of believing that difficult topics are something that we can live through. Like a hard conversation never killed anybody. You know, the having of a hard conversation is emotionally uncomfortable, but it does not need to be the be all and end all of a crisis. And getting to the point where you're not steamrollable and you're curious about a whole bunch of other possibilities is the end state, I would say, that we're shooting for. So lots of people don't start there. We have to build that. And so if things are just a big hairball of a mess, I would still say, don't panic. It's okay. This is how we develop. Like This is how we build those skills. But ultimately, yes, that's where we're headed. We're headed to, I had an idea. I'd like to discuss it with you rather than, oops, I had sex with your best friend for the last 13 years and you just found out, guess we have to talk now. Like right. what could go wrong, right? With that strategy. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's a very catastrophic example. Obviously there are less catastrophic examples, but I think it's worth mentioning that most couples who have infidelity don't break up as a result of the infidelity. Mm. Some do, lots do. And with a catastrophic example like, like that, probably most do. But interestingly, most don't. So what that tells me is that the crisis does not have to kill the relationship. But what I've noticed is a lot of people are not willing to roll up their sleeves and say, I have developed a crush on my coworker and I think I might like to act on it. That is a freaking terrifying yeah. proposition for a lot of people. They just And they might be terrified about saying it, or they might be like really terrified that their partner might say that to them. Yeah. And what I'd like to just suggest is, why is that so terrifying? Like, what if you came from a viewpoint that there's plenty of room for the two of you to talk about something hard and come to an agreement and look at something complicated and figure out what you want to do with it that doesn't involve you losing your relationship. Yeah. And it's also, you know, as you were sort of saying before, being willing to have curiosity and have that conversation doesn't commit you to an open relationship either. You know, that there is space to explore it and talk about it and be open and receptive. And you're still going to get to decide for yourself whether you want to do that or not. That's right. And so probably the question that I ask the most in therapy and the most often is what is it that you want for yourself? And aside from an answer like polyamory or monogamy, like let's talk about what that means to you. Like what comes with that that feels important to you? If you didn't know the words, how would you describe the relationship that you want? Yeah. You know, if you didn't have a label for it, what is it that you want in a relationship? Because if what you want is safety, security, reliability, honesty, transparency, a deep connection. There's nothing about those desires that is exclusive to one relationship shape. People who have workable polyamory have all of that and more. Right. So, you know, I think we have this culturally endorsed misconception that either polyamory is super shaky construct that can't possibly stand the test of time or that a secure bond is not possible in an open relationship. Both of those are simply not true. So how important is it that people have rules and agreements and like structure to to opening their relationship before they start? I mean, obviously you're talking about people that fall into this retroactively sort of too, but you know, how important it is that two people sort of hash out exactly what's allowed and what isn't, or what kind of, do they have veto power? How much do they want to know? Or all the various kinds of agreements that people might make pretty sure the chapter on agreements is my longest chapter and there might be two of them (laughs) because it's a really complicated. There are some kinds of agreements that are just made to be broken. And veto is one example. There are just some agreements that people tend not to stick to. And what I think goes into making an agreement that can be kept is those three aspects of differentiation of self and then the big hold steady underneath. I think figuring out how to make a good agreement is more important than having an agreement. Don't promise me something 
that you can't follow through on. Yeah. Because then we're going to have a broken agreement. Yeah. And then you're going to be deep dive into the repair chapter, which is freaking enormous and <laughs> also really hard to do. Right. So, and you're probably going to need a therapist on top of it. And it's just going to be a hassle. So why bother if you could just make a strong agreement in the first place? So even if you only had one agreement, but it was a real agreement, by which I mean, everybody actually agrees to it. And then it gets rediscussed before it gets broken. That would be a real agreement. Yeah. Then that's a way better construct than having 15 rules and a great big document that nobody actually thinks that they can actually do. Or maybe they already know they don't even believe in it. Or maybe they're already resentful that that rule even got put on the list. Like this is, that is not an agreement. Yeah. So making agreements that can be kept is an art form and it's a skill. And it's a necessary skill, but it does not have to be built all at one time. You can build it one agreement at a time. And that's just another example of things that apply in just couples work in general, right? Like I'm constantly talking to couples about don't agree to things that you can't agree to or that you don't inherently, like trying to get clear on what you want and what you actually believe. And then be very mindful about agreeing to something. And then you better keep exactly. it. Exactly. Right? That's right. That's yeah. right. I am super excited for some non polyamorous people in relationships to read my book and apply stuff from my book to their monogamous relationships or their dating situation or whatever they got and then give me some feedback. Because the way that I work in therapy is not different between different relationship styles. The things that come up predictably as impasses in polyamorous relationships are different. Yeah. Like In a monogamous relationship where everybody's happy with monogamy, you're probably not going to have the should we open or not open dilemma. You're probably going to have the aging parents dilemma or the how do we do the chores dilemma or I need a chore wheel, you don't want one or, you know, whatever. Yeah. So there will be some other dilemma, but the concepts absolutely apply across the board. Yeah. We have to wrap up. Is there anything we didn't, co- I mean, obviously it's the tip of the iceberg, right? We could, we could have talked for hours, but is there any main point you'd like to make before I ask you to talk about the book and where people can get it? I think the main point that I want to make is polyamory can work beautifully. You know, there are some leaders in the therapy field that have come out and said, this is not workable. It can't happen. It's not secure. There's no way to have a secure bond. I disagree and disagree and disagree. Yeah. And I don't just disagree theoretically. I disagree because I've seen it a lot. So I think we have to remember that when therapists say this isn't workable, what that means is they have not seen it work or they don't know how to make it work. And then we have to remember who shows up in a therapist's office in the first place, which would be somebody who needs some help making something work, right? Right, right. So I would say if you're looking for a therapist, keep looking until you find somebody who says, what is it that you want for yourself? And that is what I'm going to help you to achieve. Yeah. Rather than, you know, don't go to a therapist and say, is it possible to open my relationship? Unless it's a screening question. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And because if they say, I don't really think so, or I've worked with a couple of people in open relationships and they haven't worked out at all, like that's not the therapist for you. Right, right. You want the one that says, whatever it is that you want, let's figure out what are the skills for it and help you get what you want in your life. Yeah, good point. And and if that's monogamy, great. I'll back that play too. So I'm not in the business of helping everybody open their relationship. I'm in (laughs) the business of helping people who can't find a therapist to be able to get what they need. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, so what's the title of the book? When does it come out? And and is there anything else you want people to know about what you have available? The title of the book is Polyamory, a Clinical Toolkit for Therapists and Their Clients. Its official release date is May 15th. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it directly from the publisher, which is Roman Littlefield. There are a number of UK outlets. Um, You can get it from my local independent bookseller online, which is a room of one's own. So there are lots of places you can get it. And I hope you will. Yeah, I hope so too. Well, thank you so much for sharing. You know, I I have more questions than when we started, but I think we still covered a lot. (laughs) So thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. It's so fun to talk to you. And it's, man, it's a huge topic. It is. You've been listening to Better Sex. 
please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, for show notes and additional episodes. And that's a wrap for today. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, if some of this material resonates with you and you would like to make a difference and make sure that this keeps coming out in the world once a week, ongoing, there are a couple things you could do to show your appreciation. The first would be to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. That really helps us be found by new listeners when you review the show on iTunes. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash iTunes. The other thing I want to invite you to consider is becoming a Patreon. For a small monthly pledge, you get some benefits. So for $2 a month, you get advanced access to every single episode. For $5 a month, you get a chapter of my upcoming new book. And for $10 a month, I host quarterly get to know you and question and answer chats over the web. And you get invited to that. I would love to have your membership in that become part of the Better Sex family. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash Patreon, which is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Again, thanks for listening. I'm glad you're here. Feel free to comment, ask questions, get in touch. I'd love to hear from listeners. Thanks. Thanks.